Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Brad Chamberlain. This is our service for August 14th, 2022. This week we are continuing our series on faith, and we'll be looking more specifically at what it means to live by faith in our Methodist tradition. Let's join together in today's call to worship. As we are called into worship today, it is sobering to remember that when God appeared on earth in the person of Jesus, most of the world did not recognize him and therefore did not worship him. Today we ask for the faith that will open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is, that we might worship him in truth. People of God, behold and see your glory. We open our eyes to see his glory. We open our ears to hear his wisdom. We open our hands to offer him gifts. We open our mouths to sing his praise. We open our hearts to offer him our love. He is Lord. Our New Testament reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love, the know, know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's read together our prayer of confession. Holy God, you call us to a passionate, all-consuming faith, yet so frequently we give you half-hearted obedience or distracted, leftover moments of our time. You tell us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, but we find ourselves to be dull and dim in our love for others. You ask for our wholehearted faith, and we meet you with anxiety and fear. Change us from the inside out. Fan and flame the desire to want more of you. We are thankful for your unending, never-changing love for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for pursuing us when we turn our backs on you. We place ourselves at your feet, but ask that you keep us there as we continue on in our daily living. Be with us now, be with us tomorrow, and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's just take a time of silence while we each confess our own sins. Gracious God, forgive us all our fears and weaknesses, we pray. Renew and strengthen our faith in the living Christ so that we can live empowered by his presence. Hear the good news. Through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Let's recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Psalm 9, verses 1 to 2 and 7 to 11. 
I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. We started looking at faith last week. What is it? What do we mean by faith? Faith is not simply belief. Faith is putting your trust into that which you believe in. I believe that this chair exists. I have faith that it will support me, and thereby I go ahead and sit in the chair. When we have faith in Christ, it is that we trust that God is completely worthy of our trust, that Christ is completely worthy of our trust. It all comes down to trust. Last week, we looked at some of God's covenants as well as other promises throughout the scripture, which God has made and which by faith we may claim as truths in our lives, not just ideas, but solid truths. God promises to strengthen you. God promises to give you rest. God promises to take care of all of your needs. God promises to answer your prayers. God promises to work out everything for good. God promises to be with you. God promises to protect you. God promises freedom from sin. God promises that nothing can separate you from him. God promises eternal life. If we live by faith, we live with the understanding that each of these is not just an idea or even just a promise, but it's a secured reality in our lives. And so as we live by faith, we increasingly trust God, and this moves us into loving and ever-deepening relationship with God and every neighbor in which our own lives are transformed and in which we become part of the way God's love transforms the world. This faith in God, this absolute trust in the reality of God's faithfulness and of God's love within us, is an essential part of our salvation experience. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, our church tradition, taught that salvation comes by faith alone. He dismissed the notion that righteous works, even though good in themselves, accrue any merit whatsoever toward salvation. We don't we earn our salvation. Wesley observed that there are three things that, that work together to produce salvation. The first is the infinite mercy and grace of God. The second is the satisfaction of God's righteous judgment of sin based on sacrificial and substitutionary death of Christ. And the third is the individual's personal faith in the merits of Jesus Christ. Wesley insisted that such faith is not merely giving cognitive assent, but it is heartfelt trust in Christ for forgiveness of sins and confidence that God saves those who truly believe. Wesleyans teach that the moment one believes, they are saved. And by believing, they may expect to receive an inward witness of having been delivered from bondage to sin and into freedom from sin, along with eternal life. This witness is not merely a feeling in Wesley's teachings. It is the work of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the inward regeneration of character, which is described metaphorically as the new birth or being born again. Salvation by faith is trust and confidence in the work of Jesus Christ to forgive us, to reconcile us to God, and to enable our growth in righteousness and true holiness. Wesley taught that genuine faith produces both inward and outward holiness. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus commanded, Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus also taught that true Christian discipleship requires loving God 
with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving neighbor as self. Other reformers of the faith, like Luther and Calvin, tended to view perfection in the absolute sense, meaning that it was all about performance. Wesley understood it in the theological sense as having to do with maturity of character and ever-increasing love for God. The New Testament word perfection translates from a Greek term that means maturity or completion. It does not mean flawlessness. Therefore, whenever Wesley discusses holiness, sanctification, or perfection, which are all basically theological synonyms, the perf he preferred the expression Christian perfection. By appending the adjective Christian, he was trying to avoid comparisons with the reformers whose idealistic notions of perfection led them to believe that holiness is not possible in this life. Christian perfection for Wesley is achievable in this present life because it has to do with the affections. He wrote, when by the grace of God infused into the soul through the Holy Spirit, one's love for God and others is made pure and complete, their lifestyle cannot help but increase in virtue, finding expression in loving, selfless actions. Faith is great, and the implications for fullness of life in our individual lives is great, but Christianity never ends at our own experience. In fact, our own salvation is just the start. Galatians 5, 6 was one of Wesley's favorite biblical themes. It reads, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The real value of our faith is that it is expressed through love. It is in the ways in which God will use each of us, will use God's love within each of us to transform the world, like how we pray on earth as it is in heaven. So faith, it's essential, but it's just a start. The very essence of Wesley's preaching is not on faith, but it's on its effect in a believer's life. In a letter written in 1739, Wesley wrote, A man is not to think well of his own state till he experiences something within himself which he has not yet experienced, but which he may beforehand assure, assured he shall if the promises of God are true. That something is a living faith, a sure trust and confidence in God, that by the merits of Christ his sins are forgiven, and he is thereby reconciled to the favor of God. And from this will spring many other things, which till then he experienced not. As the love of God shed abroad in his heart, the peace of God which passeth all understanding, and joy in the Holy Ghost, joy though not unfelt, yet unspeakable and full of glory. For Wesley, the importance of faith is like a gate leading to what really is important, the feeling of assurance and forgiveness. For being a child of God, is not, it is not sufficient to believe. Faith only brings a state of acceptance to God, which is the state of a servant and not that of a child of God. The necessary stage is reached only when one can testify as their divine conviction that they, by faith, are in a state of life in which they experience that the Christ has loved me and given himself for me. Only when this testimony is given as an internal assurance, Wesley says, can we call ourselves a child of God. In one of Wesley's descriptions of faith, he says, faith is an assurance that Christ loved me and gave himself for me. And the words loved me and for me are emphasized in such a way that we get the impression that the assurance of faith and justification rests upon a discovery of something within us. That something is none other than what is experienced inwardly. We experience Christ's love dwelling within us, and we put our faith into that. The rest pours out from there. Wesley asks, Does anyone believe who has not the witness in himself? And then he answers, we apprehend not, seeing God being the very essence of faith, love and obedience, the inseparable properties of it. 
So for Wesley, the essence of faith is seeing God. This is so different from the other reformers by whom repeatedly faith was founded upon trusting the promises of the gospel. We don't simply trust all of the promises. We experience God's love. We put our faith in God and thereby, yes, we trust that these promises are true. And as we trust that the promises are true, we live fully in the confidence and the hope of Christ, rather than living through trying to depend on our own broken selves. God's love dwells within us. This is the core. Let's look at our reading from Ephesians. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This is quite a run-on sentence by Paul. The basic statement is, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts. And how might this happen? Through faith. It says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And where does that faith come from? It says that you are strengthened with power through Christ's Spirit in your inner being. So Christ's spirit is in our inner being, strengthening us with power, such that Christ dwells in our hearts, and we understand that, through faith. According to this verse, the power is there, the love of Christ is there, and it's through faith that we live in that power. And what happens when we lean into this trust in Christ dwelling in our hearts? According to Paul, thereby we are rooted and established in love. Because Christ's love is dwelling within us at the core of who we are. And our reading of Paul's letter to, to the Ephesians goes on to say that through this love, we have power to better understand the massive dimensions of Christ's love. A love so great that its dimensions surpass our possible understanding. And so through faith, we come to understand that we are not just filled with a speck of God, but that you are filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We are chock full of the infinity of God, of the infinite nature of God's love. And we experience this reality within us and respond in faith, moving our core center of faith from ourself and to Christ. This is salvation. This is the path we're all on. It's the same path as those spoken of in Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. We trust God's faithfulness. We trust in Christ's promises. In Wesley's words, we have trust and confidence in the work of Jesus Christ to forgive us, reconcile us to God, and enable our growth in righteousness and true holiness. And we put this childlike trust in God, childlike faith in the power of Christ, which dwells within us. That gives us this gives us an ultimate, satisfying, safe, trusting relationship. This relationship is our core identity and it can't be shaken. And it's from this place through which we are able to step into relationship with other people, to live in community, to trust one another again, to assume the best in each other's intentions, rather than meeting each person with skepticism or as a threat. We are freed to love others when we put our trust in the dependability of Christ's love. We are filled with that very love. We just have to trust in this reality. And through all of this, may we join together with the psalmist singing, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, 
have never forsaken those who seek you. Let us sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Let's pray. Gracious God of abundance, you feed the hungry from your hand and visit us in our storms. Hear your people as we pray for the whole world, saying, may we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Give to your church, O God, the power to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, that your power at work within us may accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let our leaders and all in authority bow their knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name, that they may use their power justly, feed the hungry, and share your abundance with all your children. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Receive gifts from our children and from the poor in our community and from their generosity, create a plentitude which will satisfy the true needs of every person. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. In every place of hunger, bring food, O God. In every place of poverty, bring abundance. In every place of terror, bring comfort and security. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Receive the benediction. As you go into the coming week, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you come to know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love for you really is. All glory to God, who is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare to ask or imagine. Go with God. See you all next week. Bye.